and welcome to Monster Hunting in the Modern World. My name is Britton Dabler and my name is Martin Malisma. I am your captain today for this flight. Uh, first of all, before we start, I do not endorse any of the following activities in real life. I do not endorse violence uh, as a solution against groups unless they try to kill you. Uh, you are obliged to try to kill them back at that point. Uh, I do not explode uh, exploding nuclear munitions in downtown Helsinki area. Well, that's not strictly true. Uh, all your, your sources are public sources, no matter what the police says. Uh, this presentation contains bad humor and a few wiki pictures, but I will warn you beforehand about those. First, a little bit about yours truly. Uh, I'm a blacksmith, a 3D fabricator, industrial designer, and a production designer student from 2018 to present day and a couple of years from now. There are a couple of my titles down there. If I tried to list all of my hobbies down there, we would run out of time and day. Uh, you can find me in social media behind the name Rostopore. And as you can see from the pictures, I am a very serious and very serious person only. Some people have uh, some people have reference to me with the word mad scientist, but that's not true because I have no hypothesis. I am a mad engineer. All engineers are mad. True. Uh, classic monsters from movies, uh, television, books, all sorts of media. We have vampires, we have werewolves, ghosts, demons, wendigos, yeti, shapeshifters, witches, skinwalkers, what have you. All nice to have, best when cooked well. Uh, we have a couple of uh, subcategories like vampires. We have different kinds of Striga, Bruxa, Rosalkas from uh, mostly from Eastern, Eastern Europe, and some countries have their own variations, which are basically all the same. Uh, uh, werewolves belong to the tribe of lycanthropes, which are all basically the same also, so I will refer, refer to them with the term werewolves. Uh, there are more ghosts than there are people, really. Uh, so those are referred to as ghosts. And yeah, we have all sorts of nasty things which will all try to destroy the world and take your life and perhaps make you into a monster as well. And we want to avoid that. Uh, monsters have classic weaknesses, listed here. Some of them. Uh, uh, unifying factor with the classic uh, weaknesses of monsters is that they're all expensive throughout the history. Uh, we need to remember that before modern times, things like salt needed to be made by hand for use. It was mostly made from either mining salt crystals from the ground or distilling seawater. Uh, garlic uh, is mostly there for its strong smell, because some people don't like it, and people like to not like people who are different. Uh, steaks are a common theme in monster hunting, uh, but Things that most people don't understand, not any steak is fine. They need to be specialized wood and or other materials. I will go deeper into that later in this presentation. Uh, iron, light, uh, and clubs. Does anyone know what kind of a nasty doesn't like clubs? <coughs> fairies. Some of you are laughing right now, but anybody who's read into Irish mythology knows that fairy people are not to be fucked with. They are nasty and evil. They will want to take your life. And are uh, some examples from uh, uh, different medias which do it right. Supernatural does it pretty well, even though after fifth season it's pretty much lost cause. But they do a very nice, uh, modernized take on many monster hunting methods. But sometimes they are just dumb and uninnovative. But then again, we have people who don't have higher education as main characters. Uh, other movies that do something nice include Van Helsing, which is, uh, uh, contrary to popular uh, opinion, an excellent movie, and you should definitely watch it. Uh, it has all sorts of wacky gadgets that will mostly, mo uh, mostly make your day better because they are fun to use and they will kill your foes more effectively, which will make your day even better. Uh, there are some dumb things. Uh, does anybody recognize what movie this is from? Yes, this is from Underworld, right. and can anybody tell me why UV bullets are a stupid idea? Light is faster than the bullet, precisely. Why would you shoot something with a bullet made of light when you can just shine light on it? But it does look cool. 
question like that. Uh, you can shine the light directly into their bodies and not onto their clothes, which would like absorb the light. Or you can use a magnifying lens and you can set their clothes on fire. Uh, Constantine, which, well, that picture is not exactly showing an ingenious monster hunting method because uh, I just chose this picture from Constantine because the Spear of Longinus is an excellently cool prop. But uh, Constantine is a way better movie than people give it credit for, and it has some ingenious things like using sprinklers filled with holy water. I think that is the origin of using sprinklers filled with holy water. That was uh, later used in Supernatural 2 and some other series. Uh, Hellboy, the old Del Toro movie is not the new one. The new one is all kinds of crap. Uh, here's Hellboy holding uh, his whopper or the works, bullets, which are silver tipped, filled with holy water, uh, shavings of white oak, gloves, and stuff like that. It's basically an all around bullet that will. Pretty much damage, if not kill every single kind of monster that you're about to face. Yes. We have the stereotypical monster hunter, which is a dark haired, brooding white male, Victorian gentleman, or woman, or a femme fatale. I'm using Buffy here because I had to put Buffy somewhere in this presentation because Buffy is awesome. Uh, they're always wearing a leather jacket, a flannel shirt, or accompanied by an old American car and daddy issues. Uh, or an expensive suit, in quotations. Uh, and also we have here uh, John Constantine, which would disagree with me about the expensive part at least. They have an unhealthy lifestyle, poor stance, and they generally don't have any roots in civilization. So they're basically murder hobos who go about uh, doing crime and killing monsters. And killing monsters in quite big quotations, because at least some and Dean Winchester are actually super poor at killing monsters. Basically, the only reason why they're still alive is because God literally doesn't let them die. But we can do better. We can start with proper equipment. We can have military gear. Which is, because monster hunting, let's face it, is a military operation. It's not a hobby that you can do while running around. You need if you actually, if your priority is to live, which it should be, your priority is not to kill a monster, save things, hunting things, uh, save people hunting things, family business. That is not your priority. Your priority is to live and make sure that every other human around you lives too. Except the civilian population can be expendable at some point. Uh, you want modern military getup. You want firearms, wet gear, body armor, explosives, all the nice things in the world. You want medium to heavy armor. You want to be cut resistant. You want uh, want ballistic protection because some creatures actually can operate firearms. And you want plate armor uh, against monsters which deliver uh, crushing uh, or other sorts of uh, what is it? Blunt trauma, trauma precisely. But you do not want to compromise your mobility because that is actually one of your uh, uh, advantages at that point. Because some monsters can't move as much as you can. Some monsters are vulnerable to sunlight or have a pr uh, precise habitat like a cave or some sort of a den that they inhabit. Uh, but some monsters also, most monsters actually, uh, exceed your physical capabilities. They have better hearing, better eyesight, they can see in the dark. But that can be counteracted with uh, technology, because technology is our friend and not theirs. Uh, we can have thermal optics, night optics, enhanced hearing protection that will also enhance your hearing. Uh, we can have satellite imaging, so we can track an area, uh, especially if we have a big monster, like if you have, have a uh, suspicion that we have a werewolf in some area, we can track that area via satellite and we can actually have good enough reconnaissance of the area that we can possibly pinpoint which person is the werewolf via satellite imaging alone. Uh, but because technology can solve everything, we have chemists to stand for different stimulants to heighten your senses and improve performance. Uh, again, I do not endorse this in civilian life, but uh, amphetamines can be found in a combat situations. And drones! We have uh, remote operable devices that can fly into areas where we cannot, because humans are in the end quite big creatures. Uh, imagine in your next RPG session when, sh session when a vampire turns into a cloud of smoke or bats or something and you just whip out a drone and follow it right where it lives. 
And the girls can come with attachments, which I will uh, come into later in this presentation. You had a question there. Well, I'm just commenting that you're the girls with flamethrowers. Yes. And flamethrowers are actually not picky about the fuel they use. We can come to that later too. Here are some examples of night vision systems. Uh, night vision systems are actually quite easy to get a hold of, ION 7. Uh, here we see a first generation tube, a second stage tube. You can see the difference there. The first tube has a, a, a very heavy fish eye effect on the edges, which will affect your performance in a combat situation especially. And also it is a quite poor uh, light magnifica uh, magnification. Uh, second stage tu tube is a better one, less fish eye, better uh, light amplification. But we have even better, we have a third generation system which are crazy expensive, like $10,000 a piece. Uh, and we have even better system, which is called an L3 ground panoramic night vision goggles, which we actually saw here, worn by the Velociraptor, which, as shown in this picture, has a field of view of 97 degrees versus the 40 degree field of view of a single tube system. These things cost upwards of $20,000 and are generally not available to the public. But, because uh, as we know, monster hunters are known criminals or a government entity, this is not a problem. But we can do even better, because scientists have delivered onto us a system that combines thermal goggles and night vision systems. We can uh, see that the light, uh, ambient light in this picture is amplified and the heat signature of the people moving in it are shown, highlighted. Uh, this system is actually a functional system, it's called an ANPS 220 b Enhanced night vision goggles. There. I'm just wondering because I assume that the most of the uh, monsters don't generate heat. So if you have something that is moving and does not generate heat, so you could actually use a computer to pinpoint that there is something suspicious in that area. This is true, uh, but that is also uh, a thing. Uh, we can work on that too because if someone does if something doesn't emit body heat, we can always warm warm the environment swiftly which will so show their body or whatever they are as a cooler point. Because things always emit some sort of radiation. We can find them with technology. But that, that is a good addition, thank you. And here we can see this is a cheap uh, infrared system, something like uh, this, even some mobile telephones today have front-looking infrared cameras. And as you can see, a camouflage person can't be seen with naked eye, but can easily be seen with thermal goggles. Moving isn't on. There, isn't there a problem with this kind of infrared uh, thing is that you, you do see the person, but you don't necessarily see the, all the obstacles that are in your way? This is true, too. But uh, if we are suitably funded yeah, organization, this is not a problem because yeah, we have. That's for sure that it's yes. A problem. Because, like the civilian population, the environment is also expendable. Uh, and into some crunch, there is a surprising amount of mathematical models and studies made on the spreading of vampirism, or a uh, surprising amount, which is more than one, it was actually six. Uh, and this is the earliest one, uh, I don't actually remember the year when it was made, but called Transylvania Problem of Renewable Resources, by Richard Hazel and Alexander Melman. Uh, in this scenario, uh, for every feeding, this is a classic, this is Dracula scenario. So we have a vampire which feeds on humans and turns the humans that it feeds on into vampires. So for every feeding we have one more vampire and one less human to feed the vampires. So we have an exponential growth uh, of the vampire population which leads into the ultimate demise of the human population. Uh, everybody dies. And then we have this monster of a name which is the most recent study made on this subject in 2013 by William Stilkowski, Evgeny Lissin, Emily Wilkins, and it was published in the Applied Mathematical Sciences. And they have a three different scenarios for different vampire uh, models. We have the Stoker King model, which is basically the same model as the previous one, uh, in which the human population is era eradicated in 165 days completely. Uh, the exp uh, expansion of the vampire population goes from one entity to a, uh, 4,000 in just two months. And that's a lot of vampires. Uh, but a lot of vampires is not a problem if we are a suitably funded entity, perhaps government entity. 
Uh, then we have the Rice model based on the books by Anne Rice, which are, as some of you probably know, the vampires in Anne Rice's novels are less violent variety. They don't necessarily kill the people they feed on, and turning a person into a vampire needs to be a conscious decision that cannot be done involuntarily. Uh, but even so, the mathematical model predicts that human population will be extinct in approximately 50 years. And then we have the harris meyer kostova model, which is based on uh, books by uh, Meyer, Twilight, unfortunately. Uh, then we have the ha Harris books, which uh, were adapted later in the True Blood TV series. And I don't remember, uh, Kostova's book was called The Historian, I think, in which vampires are basically just brooding old people living in graves who talk to people occasionally. Uh, yes? Uh, uh, these models are based on the fact that, uh, based on the idea that the vampire can keep living after they, without being fed by humans, because I assume that this would be quality to love vodka lot of work. So if the human population starts going down, then vampires are going to have a problem feeding themselves. Uh, yes, as I stated here, uh, the, there is a balance. But this model is actually a, a model where the human vampire coexistence is possible. Uh, because the vampires don't necessarily need to eat, they feed themselves every day. Feeding doesn't kill humans or turn them into vampires necessarily, but that does happen. For, for example, in the, uh, Harris's books, uh, vampire blood is like a drug to humans, so there are some humans who are actually actively killing vampires. And that is also a part of the, the fragile equilibrium of two races who are feeding on each other. Uh, but this is uh, very dependent upon the fluctuations of birth death rates. For example, if we have a large war, like a world war or an epidemic or a pandemic that kills a lot of people around the world, that balance would be upset and that would tip the scales towards the vampires and the vampires would again kill everyone. Or to the other direction, if the human uh, birth rate rises, there are more humans uh, which will, uh, well, statistically kill more vampires and eventually the vampires will die out. Again, these are not uh, realistic scenarios per se, these are mathematical models which rely on probabilities. I also assume that there is no there is no problem with vampire to vampire conflict because one of the things that you assume that the vampire haven't been taken over and killed the killed everybody that there are too too many vampires in a small area and they start fighting each other for the hunting rights or whatever if their their nature is such so that would be reasonable assumption to if you want to say that the vampires are all but they have not eaten all the humans so that would be I think realistic. That. Yes, that's also a vampire and a vampire conflict is definitely a realistic scenario. Uh, these studies are, if I remember correctly, mostly based on traditional predator prey uh, mathematical models used on uh, predicting the growth of different animal populations around the world. So, in this scenario, in these mathematical models, it's mostly assumed that there is no uh, conflicts inside the vampire population, but that is definitely possible. So I understand that the very few animals actually actually have a lethal, con a lethal conflict between themselves uh, for the food or for the females. But yes. Uh, there are, there are, I assume that there are also species which do that, but it's generally it's not it's generally highly uh, highly rare. Yes. Yeah, animal population. Uh, this deviates a little bit from the subject of uh, the presentation, but yes, uh, the, uh, the traditional fight or flight response happens only when the, your enemy is not of the same race uh, or uh, creature type that you are. Uh, when you have, for example, a uh, human against a human in a conflict, there is two other options that arise, uh, which are uh, threaten or submit. Because uh, there is a great study written uh, by a Finnish major in 2009 called uh, The Psychology of Killing, in which he concludes that killing is something that we learn, which is actually quite a heartwarming thing. That is not a natural thing for a uh, creature or a human to kill its own kind. But back to vampires. Uh, there are actually movies which take into th this into account. My favorite, which is Daybreakers, released in 2009, which uh, revolves around the, uh, a world in which vampires have taken over the world. Humanity are a minority on the, in the world, and most of them are either enslaved as living blood bags or part of a resistance movement. Uh, and actually, the movie like takes place in the end of this era. Vampires are dying uh, because blood is running out. And 
this movie has the best weapon combination ever, illustrated here by this character whose actual name is Elvis. He has a double barrel shotgun with a top mounted uh, crossbow for shooting stakes at vampires. Another excellent thing about this movie is that they don't shy around the fact that vampires die in sunlight, they explode like grenades. And that's just pleasing to me. <laughs> Watch this movie, I highly recommend it. Another one that I highly recommend is Trolljägeren, released in 2010, or by its English name, The Troll Hunter. Uh, this is a Norwegian fan footage film, uh, revolving around film students who are making a document about illegal poaching. And they come across this weird man in multiple places where poaching is reported, and they start following him. Uh, the troll population in Norway is under control by the government, and the uh, uh, combat against them is actually funded by the government. Uh, and it's very effective, and this population is kept out of the popular media and the knowledge of the general populace. Watch this movie. It is quite excellent and possibly the only good found footage movie ever made. Uh, let's move on. Let's move on to talking about silver bullets and why they suck. Uh, silver bullets are actually a very, very tricky subject. Because as anyone who has done any kind of shooting sports knows that making bullets is a very precise thing. You need to make hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands and millions of exactly similar and identical pieces of metal. Uh, and there's a reason why bullets are made out of lead and copper mostly. Uh, because they are malleable metals which are easy to cast and easy to machine and operate. Uh, versus silver, which isn't, because uh, as we know, uh, lead has been used in bullets because lead is easy to cast into molds. But every single time you see a movie where somebody melts silver and pours it into a bullet mold, uh, actually what they would uh, succeed in doing at that point would be just the silver solder, the mold shut, making it completely useless. Uh, plus... So uh, you can't get it out from the mold? Yeah, you're basically fusing the mold shut and making it completely useless forever. That You're talking it, about metal mold and not, yes. about, not clay, because if you make from a clay, uh, I hoc model, then you can break it apart and you have yes, you, like a silver bullet. Yes, I'm, I'm coming to that point. Okay. Uh, you could make a mold from other materials, like uh, plaster or clay or something, but then we have the problem of repeatability, uh, because if you're making a destructive, the, the uh, mold that will be destroyed, like a uh, clay mold or uh, in, uh, investment plaster mold, uh, you would need to have a, a, well, the mold is broken, so your mold is going to be different for every time, which means that there are di uh, small differences uh, in the cost of it every time, which means that it is even more, uh, uh, what is it? Unpredictable. Unpredictable, yes. Uh, than it would be made by traditional methods. Plus, uh, cost material is always uh, a little bit sketchy, especially silver, because casting silver is a little bit difficult because you need to uh, add uh, running agents into it and flux so that the casting will actually work at all. Which brings us to an another point, because uh, we don't know does the silver need to be pure? Do we need to have 100% pure silver or can we use, say, sterling silver, which is used in jewelry? Uh, this is something that would require a huge system to test and find out that what, which, where is the tipping point where uh, we can use uh, an alloy silver, which is effective against the monster, versus using a pure silver, which is very expensive. Uh, silver costs like 530 point something euros uh, per kilogram, which is a lot, considering that the single bullet weight uh, weighs generally about eight grams. 8 to 12 or above that if we're using higher calibers. Uh, silver is also less dense than lead or copper. It delivers uh, less of a ballistic impact on targets, so uh, cost tissue damage is uh, less than that delivered by a lead bullet. And because silver is a slightly harder metal than the copper or lead, uh, it doesn't engage the rifling of a firearm as effectively as copper or lead does, so its ballistics are somewhat unpredictable. Uh, the only way to make reliable and uh, repeatable and uh, identical silver bullets is by CNC machining them on a CNC lathe. And CNC lathes are very expensive, which tips us to the direction, again, of a huge government entity. This is not something that you make in your garage. 
or you can, but that's very expensive again, and uh, well, you need a specialist for that, and they are doing that for their entire lives, and you have no time for hunting monsters anymore. If we can alloy silvers, uh, a nice alloy for a bullet silver would be like 97% silver and 3% copper, because that makes it soft enough that it would engage the rifling of a firearm, which would make it more stable and more accurate. Yes? Uh, I have one idea how you could uh, do these ad hoc is to take uh, hollow point bullets and then just fill the hollow point and put something which is... I will come to that in the next ah, slide. Sorry. Back there. Yeah, I was also going to say uh, shotguns or... Uh, also the next slide. Yes. Ah, <laughs> Other applications of silver. Uh, here we have an example of a 7M31 armor piercing bullet used by the Russian military. Uh, we have here is a, a hardened tungsten dark carbide core, which is intended for penetrating armor uh, shrouded in a copper jacket. Uh, with this method, we could minimize the amount of silver used while retaining ballistic stability of the projectile. Uh, this is a very expedient method, but again, uh, this kind of system would require a, uh, an ammunition factory to ensure a, a stable and reliable supply of silver bullets or silver cartridges. Uh, but loading silver pellets into a shotgun is even easier. And shotguns are nice because uh, shotguns also give... Uh, shotguns are easily reloaded or uh, the uh, payload of a shotgun round is easy to modify even at home. Uh, we can use just pure silver, like uh, silver shotgun slugs. We can use silver pellets or we can use mixed munitions like uh, small silver rods sharpened at one end mixed in with uh, similar sharpened wooden rods, which act, act as a miniature stake. Uh, and we can load different things like uh, other types of flechettes, uh, mixed munitions, and my favorite, which would be the Dragon's Breath Round, in which you load <coughs> magnesium pellets. Uh, as we know from high school chemistry, magnesium burns at a very, very bright and uh, hot flame, which will basically ignite everything it touches. Uh, and when fired from a shotgun, the overpressure of the shotgun uh, uh, shotgun cartridges uh, firing will actually ignite the magnesium and it will shoot like a 50 to 100 meter flame out of your shotgun. Extremely effective, especially indoors. This will light your bow on fire. So, uh, actually, so it's actually, if you, if you just put a magnesium thing into the shotgun shell, it actually, actually has a enough, enough uh, time to actually ignite the, the magnesium. Yes. Okay, because I thought because magnesium is quite hard to get lighted if you do it with a uh, with a pocket lighter, you're gonna go into spend several seconds before getting it. But yeah, uh, you, say need, so. you need to cut it into very small pieces, so the thermal mass that needs to be ignited is smaller. But it definitely does work. You can look up videos on the internet about that. They look quite pretty. But do beware, in Finland, uh, dragon's breath rounds are considered especially dangerous ammunition, and uh, possession of those is prohibited and limited from the civilian population. So be careful while having fun. Uh, Uh, the question was uh, if the Dragon's Breath rounds are going to do anything to a huge monster which are able, capable of, for example, crushing a car. Well, uh, yes, they might not do anything, but that's why we put the silver pellets mixed in with the magnesium. And uh, I'm pretty sure that no living or undead being likes being on fire. This is my theory. Uh, that is also the uh, fire. Some monsters are vulnerable to fire, but the fire is there mostly to distract it and make its life painful and miserable, while you're uh, using other methods to get completely rid of it. Uh, so yes? You could also use uh, holy water in a shotgun. Yes, you could, uh, but there are more, uh, even more nice things that you can do with holy water. I will come to that later. Uh, also, if you want a monster-proof house, you can uh, uh, silver plate your door handles, uh, cutlery that you use in the kitchen, uh, all these sorts of things. Actually, in history, uh, during the uh, ship and sail era, uh, during sh uh, long voyages, the ship's water, the freshwater tanks actually had a handful of silver coins at the bottom because silver has uh, antibacterial properties. It actually kills bacteria uh, in fluids. And it's also actually very handy in doorknobs because door knobs get, and door handles get touched a lot and the bacteria that is spread through them is 
they run up the that is nasty. Uh, silver kills all bacteria in the dawn of in approximately 15 minutes, so it's also very effective. This is also one of the reasons why silver has been very expensive and considered holy in history, because it has those magical healing properties. Uh, another thing is that uh, prior to the uh, Industrial Revolution in the early 1800s, uh, the atmosphere actually didn't have enough carbon in it that silver would tarnish, so it stayed bright once you polished it. This is one of the reasons why it had, uh, was thought to have magical properties. But then the stakes, stakes are getting high. As stated previously, as it, just any wood, sharpened wooden stick is not enough to kill a monster. Uh, varying uh, mythologies have different methods of killing monsters. Some people specify that it needs to be white oak, or white ash, or hawthorn. Uh, White oak, especially in the Eastern Europe area, because uh, uh, in the Slavic mythologies, uh, white oak was considered the wood of Perun, their head god, uh, somewhat equivalent to the Norse Odin. Uh, stakes are a very nice projectile. They are easy. You can just make a spear, completely out of wood, and throw it around. Uh, or you can launch it with a crossbow, an air gun, uh, or a spear thrower like the uh, Atla that uh, shown here on the top. Uh, this is actually just a lever that you use to amplify the force of your arm into throwing a spear. These are remarkably accurate things. I have built a few of these myself and tested them, and you can easily start getting, uh, let's say, hitting a cow size target at 100 meters, like within an afternoon of training. These are extremely easy and expedient weapons. Uh, then we can use punji traps, like here. This is from a US manual of the Vietnam era. Uh, these are nasty things. You basically just dig a pit and uh, stick some stakes on the bottom of it, and when a monster falls there, it's going to have a really bad day. And we have a YouTube video. Here, this YouTube video is actually part of the reason that inspired me to make this presentation. Uh, Mr. Heinemann, continue. <coughs> the song is not on. The song is not on. It's for a laptop. He's different people than mine. There we go. And here we go. Well, technology doesn't agree with me again. Well, exactly what kind of uh, force that you decide you need in that particular case. Something you might not want to put in that is something you were showing me earlier. Oh, yeah. This is. Uh, <laughs> These are actually uh, from a coat rack. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like a, the perfect fit. And I figure, uh, why wouldn't you use this if you're making a vampire movie? These things would have to stick in you. I mean, we just shot a, a dog toy completely through a wad of sound blankets. Uh, with something like this, <laughs> it's, if you're a vampire, you don't want to get hit by that. Do not try this at home. <laughs> Firing in three, two, one. <laughs> I'm just saying, if you were a vampire, you know, six of these going into you, you wouldn't be happy. It went in one side of the bucket, through the water, out, out the other side of the bucket, and put a dent in the wall over there. So that's a, I dare say that if Eclipse launcher guys didn't really have this in mind, but, uh, you know, if I was going after vampires, I'd have one of these, I think. So yeah, this is called, as Mr. Heinemann there explained, an Eclipse Defense Technologies launcher, and it used uses uh, high-pressure air to propel projectiles. It's generally intended for use in law enforcement operations, and it takes basically anything that you can just push down into the cylinder. Uh, this is also good because you can use mixed munitions with this too. You, uh, this doesn't have the overpressure that a shotgun has, so magnesium is useless. But uh, let's say a flechette round of wooden and silver rods will work in this very well. Also, this is commercially available, not only to law enforcement people, but also to civilian population. 
And uh, another nasty thing that you could try is making a combined wood projectile. You can make a laminate stake from, for, for example, three, three wood uh, woods listed here, and you can even add a silver tip to that so you would have a hard metal point so it would penetrate clothing and the primitive armor more easily. And another thing that I discovered actually just two days ago, which actually almost turned my entire presentation around, was this thing. That's right, that, this, that is a belt-fed, uh, drum magazine-fed uh, nail gun which shoots tiny wooden nails, which are basically miniature stakes. This is the Beck Lignolov F60, or as it should be called, the Vampire 9000, which would probably triple their sales. Uh, also probably actually very useful as a tool for woodworkers. You are welcome. I kind of want one, thanks Johan. <laughs> but isn't that in many mythologies, the thing about the, uh, putting the stake is that you have to attach the vampire to the ground, because the idea is that if you make a like if you cut a vampire's hand or something off, it will almost instantly grow back. So the fact that it's impaled into the ground prevents it from healing from that. So uh, that if, if, if that's the mythology thing, then it of course won't work just making holes with the stakes and the vampire. Uh, yes. Uh, then or then you have to have a longer stake so you could add that's the vampire to then, uh, something else. Uh, yes. The origin of the stake. Uh, in mythology is that it's used to attach the vampire into the bottom of the grave that it is killed into uh, to prevent it from waking back into life. Uh, but this has been perverted in subsequent uh, media products where the stake actually kills the vampire. So it depends on the mythology. Uh, my, my opinion would be to play it safe and do both. Also, that's a very strapping bullet of saw you have there. Uh, moving on. We have the problematic nature of holy water because uh, holy water actually doesn't spoil. Once you bless water, it, it's holy and it remains holy forever. So uh, that's a problem. There's no limits as to how much water you can bless at once. So uh, priests don't recognize their power. They would actually just probably should go to the Atlantic and bless the entire ocean at once. Uh, water doesn't need to be pure to be blessed. Uh, about 10 years ago, during the swine flu epidemic in the United States, uh, Catholic churches actually actually broke from the tradition of having a vat of holy water at the door of the church, because uh, the uh, holy water basins would actually spread germs like crazy. Uh, uh, I know this also because I'm um, uh, actually asking uh, technological questions about holy water actually pisses Christians off a lot. I know this because uh, I went uh, uh, politely asking things about holy water uh, from three different Catholic Christian forums and I was banned from everyone in about 15 minutes. But the thing is that the world is catching on to this. Here we have people like this guy. <laughs> modern problems, modern solutions. Uh, so yeah, there's progress. Maybe the world will be saved. Question then. In theory, there's a chance of holy water spoiling if God takes away the blessing from the water for some reason. There's one possibility of it spoiling, of spoiling, but not working anymore as intended. Yes, uh, there was a comment about uh, uh, there is one chance of holy water spoiling, which is if God takes the holiness away from the water. Uh, this is definitely true, but also, um, in my experience, God doesn't really take part in the life of this planet a lot. Uh, this is also agreed on by some religious people too, but uh, that, this is a, that's a religious question and I'm an engineer. Uh, let's talk about iron. Iron is more of my forte because I'm a blacksmith. Uh, iron. Uh, believed to repel monsters, especially ghosts, is actually thought to be wrought iron, uh, which people generally think that iron that's forged is wrought iron, which is not true. Uh, wrought iron is actually iron which has been purified without melting it, as in refined from an ore into an iron ingot without melting it at all. Uh, this is called uh, bloomery steel, which is made, uh, basically you make a smokestack, that you fill with carbon, set it on fire, and just lay the iron ore on top. And uh, the, 
the temperatures will get high enough that the iron will get very hot, almost molten, and it will travel down the uh, smokestack, and when it uh, meets other pieces of iron, those will fuse together into a single bloom, which will collect at the bottom, uh, or in a crucible, in the bottom of the smokestack. Uh, this is called cold iron, because it doesn't melt in the process, it just, yeah, it doesn't melt. Uh, where was I going? Uh, yes, uh, this is a very uh, labor-intensive method of uh, refining iron, uh, which for many years until the mid-1800s was the only method of refining iron, or one of the only methods of refining iron known to man. Uh, the Bessemer process was invented in which uh, iron is actually melted to purify it, and the impurities flows into the top of the molten iron, those are gathered away, so we have a much purer base material at that point. Uh, Wrought iron is a bit problematic also because it's impure, so we don't really know if it's the iron or its properties because it, uh, that repel the monsters. Uh, because wrought iron is never the same because the methods are uh, as primitive as I just described. So the composition of the alloy materials are never completely known, and we don't know what actually is a part of this uh, alloy that repels the monster. Uh, like said, the monsters are repelled by iron. Uh, ghosts. The last point there, I was just coming to that. Uh, ghosts are speculated to be repelled by iron because ghosts are speculated to be a form of magnetic or electric radiation. Question there, yes? Uh, what about fairies? I seem to remember that they are also. Yes, uh, fairies, and, iron. fairies and some goblins in Irish mythologies are also repelled by iron. Is there a reasoning behind that, like with ghosts? It's expensive. Ah. <laughs> There was another question. Yeah, about the fairies. Yes. Fairies are nasty people. If you encounter them, run. The uh, picture that we have here is actually called a really nice diagram called the Iron's Delta Phase Diagram. On the bottom we have here is a carbon person, starting from zero and going to the uh, right, it's, uh, it goes up. And here we, on the uh, Y scale we have temperature. Uh, and here we have the different properties and the uh, compositions and the uh, crystalline structure of iron at different temperatures. As you can see, uh, everything from 2% to the left is considered steel, anything from 2% to the right is considered cast iron. Uh, there are a lot of symbols and things that uh, it would take me an evening to explain, but basically that uh, the amount of carbon allied into iron has a lot of effect on the iron's melting point, for example, and its magnetism so forth. But that's beyond the scope of this presentation. But yeah, what all of this means is that uh, Paris is probably okay with ghosts, because the Eiffel Tower is one of the largest known structures made completely out of wrought iron. This is also a huge problem, because uh, maintaining the Eiffel Tower is very expensive. Moving on, we have symbols, protective hexes, and landmines, because those are some of my favorites. Uh, some of you will probably recognize this symbol here. How many of you recognize this? Yes. This is the uh, protective symbol uh, from Supernatural, which is actually completely false and it was invented by the showrunners. This is not actually from the Key of Solomon as claimed in the book, book uh, TV series. Uh, here we have also a sprinkler system that are filled with holy water, just uh, as in a fire sprinkler system like this we have here or sprinklers in your yard, well, can be loaded with holy water. Uh, another nasty thing that we can do with silver is take a claymore mine, like pictured here, and fill, uh, uh, claymore mines are mines which are filled with explosive, and in front of the explosive we have approximately 200, about 10 millimeter uh, diameter steel ball bearings. And when the explosive explodes, it uh, propels the uh, ball bearings in an arc, front of it at uh, exceeding the high velocities. So it would be very nice to replace those steel ball bearings with silver ball bearings, which would be very expensive but very effective. Uh, the front of the claymore mine says front to our enemy, the back of, back of it says that you should not eat it. I'm actually not kidding with that. Uh, you can also have hollow doorsteps and window sills and fill those cavities with salt or something similar that repels monsters. Uh, salt is another thing that, well, actually I've spoken about that already. Yeah. Uh, but yes, uh, more on the symbol. That is 
fake. That's more like it. That was on the top of uh, on the floor ceiling of Bobby Singer's apartment in some in some episode of the first or second season. I don't remember. It is based on the fifth pentacle of Mars, which actually is from the Key of Solomon and looks like this. But as we can see, they replaced text on the outer rim with Hebrew. And uh, so it's not completely the same, it technically shouldn't work, but, uh, well, it's a TV show, so we have to make some allowances. Also, a funny thing about the fifth pentacle of Mars, uh, it is described as being terrifying sight unto angels and demons. So it's a double whammy. You can also fight angels with this. Uh, uh, I'm not for overdoing it, so here we also have a heavy claymore mine used by the Finnish military. This is 11 and a half kilograms of hexagonal explosive versus the approximately two or three kilograms in the smaller version. And it has an approximately a lot of steel ball bearings in front of that. So uh, this is utilized against uh, smaller uh, unarmored or light armored vehicles. This will, this will totally uh, take an SUV and probably a few tens of meters to the side. All in all fun things. Uh, moving on. Let's talk about tactical analysis of targets. Uh, we have monsters, we have capabilities. Uh, we should never just waltz into a monster just to fight it without preparing for it. Uh, because we are smart people, most of, most of us, and if we want to live, we will be smart people. So we will start making a threat analysis of the target. So uh, like previously mentioned, uh, we will use every single resource available us to reconnaissance the area that the monster operates in. Uh, we will, uh, every single strategy depends on the monster at hand. So, uh, uh, how many of you have done an SWOT analysis? There we go. That's a, a very effective tool, even in this scenario. Uh, that's a, uh, strengths, weaknesses, uh, oh, what, what, what is opportunities, it? threats, analysis. And these are all things that we should take into mind. Uh, here we have the U.S. Air Force military analysis of the Battle of the Winterfell from the latest season of Game of Thrones. Sorry about the spoilers. Uh, uh, we need to take into note uh, our own assets, like CAS, which is close air support. Do we have, for example, helicopter? Do we have air cover? Do we have bombers in our uh, use? Do we have uh, surveillance drones or surveillance satellites? Uh, does the area of operation work in our favor? Uh, or does the landscape work in the favor of the monster? For example, um, uh, wendigos and uh, werewolves are generally encountered in forest environments. Uh, does the area of operation have, for example, caves? Does it have rivers or something? That works either into the monster or our favor. Uh, how strong is our force? Are we going against it with five guys or 500? Uh, do we have vehicles? Uh, is the civilian population a threat? Because around some monsters, uh, people, because people are religious things, some people believe that monsters are gods. So they might form cults around the monster, and those people might be willing to fight us because we are willing to take out the monster and actually save their lives. Uh, do we have defended assets? Uh, so do we have civilian population in the area? Uh, most of the cases, civilian population are expendable because people will just make more people. Uh, do we have culturally important sites? Because, uh, well, historical sites are also technically expandable, but nobody's going to remake those. Uh, and question marks, what else is there? Do we have, I don't know, do we like this building basically a lot more than the others? Do we want to blow it up? Do we not? Is it an important uh, uh, logistical center or is the infrastructure around it uh, unexpendable or important to save? of the operation of the country or something. Um, let's look at some creatures in specific. Let's start with vampires. Then we have a list of weaknesses of vampires from different mythologies. There's actually an excellent table on this on Wikipedia about different mythologies of vampires and their weaknesses listed. And uh, it was too big to be included into this presentation, but do look it up. It's just on the Wikipedia vampire page. Uh, things that were surprising to me that vampires actually can be brown. Uh, rain, uh, and drowning and running water are something that surprised me. Like, uh, if you took a vampire and uh, does, does a sea count as running water? 
Is it enough if we evacuate an island and just leave a vampire there? Uh, where does a river, to, where does running water end and where does a sea begin? So this is another thing that should be tested. Uh, holy symbols are generally believed to work only if you believe in them. But it doesn't need to be a cross, it could be another religious symbol, as long as you believe in. Arithmomania was also, does anybody know what this is? Uh, was it that they had to count the speed of other people? Yes, the uh, observation to count things, like, uh, especially in Chinese mythologies, it is believed that leaving a bag of rice on your doorstep will uh, repel a monster from entering your house. Yes? I think it's being Yes, it's uh, beans or anything, like a bag of sand or something that has a high particle count. Worse. And what would MacGyver do? Uh, we should have crossbows and stakes, because those are the most easy and expedient methods. We could also have the Eclipse Launcher, or the Vampire Killer 9000 uh, nail gun, or anything like that. We could also, just like, if we have a government entity, we should have a research division, just experiment with, with the, this and just making all sorts of wacky things. Uh, monofilament wire, which is just very thin and with, uh, wire with a high tensile strength at neck height, uh, which could be used to trap doorways, but I'm pretty sure that would only work in certain scenarios. Uh, the UV flashlights and the UV floodlights. Uh, there was actually a friend of mine mentioned that uh, in uh, Shadowrun there are actually vampires written into the game. But uh, most of our colleges actually have UV floodlights at the entrances because UV light is also used to sterilize things. So in some, uh, that's actually a very good idea. Just put UV floodlights at your door. Everyone who steps in gets flooded with UV light. Yes. So the idea is that it's uh, so it's substitute as the sunlight. So the sunlight isn't dangerous uh, for the vampire because. It comes from the sun, but it's dangerous for the vampire because it's the ultraviolet light, which is normal light, so we don't have. That's uh, the idea. Uh, yes, the question was that uh, is the UV, the ultraviolet light, the dangerous part of sunlight? This is speculated to be the case. Uh, this is again something that should be experimented, but this is widely used in different uh, mythologies like, or uh, media products like, oh, well, the UV bullets in Underworld. Uh, and actually, in the Thrall movie, the main character has a huge, like basically a huge camera flash, which is used to flash UV light at trolls, because trolls in mythology can't spend uh, sunlight either. Fire truck is my favorite about vampire hunting tool now. You could just, well, does the fire, uh, does the water coming from the fire hose actually count as running water? If we have a sprinkler in the yard, does it count as running water? These are ex questions that need to be answered. Yes? The running water in most mythologies has to be natural. Yes. Do water lines, which humans have built underwater, count as running water? Does it need to be on the ground? These are questions that need to be answered. Basically, any mythologist just falls apart when you start applying engineering and mathematics into it. But since we're fond of overdoing doing things, we are overdoing things. Moving on. Let's talk about skinwalkers and wendigos. Uh, is a skinwalker a familiar term to you people? Couple of people. Skinwalker is basically a variation of wendigo. It is a human that uh, has gone into the wilderness and gone insane somehow, uh, generally by eating human meat in a survival scenario, and then they turn into a monster which feeds on people. Uh, the skinwalker uh, also generally has the aspect that it can shapeshift into other forms or imitate human speech or your, the sound of your friends and so on and so on. Uh, nobody really, the, the mythologies are very, very uh, irregular, so we don't really know what they are vulnerable to. Uh, white ash is referred to, we don't know if it's referring to the wood or a literal white ash, which is like ash that we get from burning. Uh, but it's generally believed that violence is a solution here. You should kill it until it dies. Uh, some people refer to silver, and uh, silver is a, also, well, it's expensive, but it's a method of killing it until it dies. Or you could uh, drive it into an extinction by destruction of its habitat, which is generally uh, means burning forests to the ground, which is fun. Maybe not environmentally stable solution. Oh. 
Yes, not an environmentally stable solution, but our point is to not die within the next, say, two months. Uh, well, the climate change is also uh, going to kill us all, so technically just drive your very expensive American car around and it's going to kill not only us, but also the monsters. I mean. uh, then let's talk about werewolves. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a little bit easier creatures, uh, because we know a lot about their mythology. They are generally killed by silver or stakes, or silver stakes. Uh, they are generally vulnerable to fire, because furry things burn. If it doesn't kill them, it will make them very uncomfortable, as previously stated. Uh, they have heightened sense of smell, like many dogs have, which means that we can drown them in ammonia and make their life even more painful. Uh, this is actually a very effective case, uh, effective method of hunting a creature that has a heightened sense of smell, that you uh, just saturate its living or hunting area with a substance that has a strong smell, like ammonia, which will completely uh, wipe one of their strongest, uh, strongest uh, assets out, which will also make it impossible for it to track you and your unit which you are operating with. Uh, blunt force trauma is generally thought to work, uh, but if it goes to the ground, uh, you burn the ground so it has no ground too. Uh, much like an alien or aliens, uh, the best option is a nucleoside from orbit. It's the only way to be sure. Uh, what will my guy ever do? Flamethrowers, uh, ammonia, lots of cocktails, shotguns loaded with the pre-mentioned uh, silver pellets and magnesium pellets, anti-personal mines, carpet bombing, you know, the works. Uh, yeah, by this point it's really getting to be really expensive to be a monster hunter. Uh, it's really difficult to steal all the equipment that you need or buy it or whatever. If we only had like a global organization which is like maybe government funded or funded by the UN or something to combat monsters and oh, yeah. Well, the BPRD uh, from Mike Mignola's Hellboy is actually a little bit sketchy organization because it actually employs monsters to hunt monsters. So once we wipe out all the monsters, we have these friendly monsters that are a threat now. And uh, um, so we kind of need to be a little bit more strict with that. Oh, we have Axcom. But yeah, Axcom actually fights only aliens and it's kind of a space racist organization, but they're competent and they're funded. Uh, if only it would hunt other things too. Oh, <laughs> so there we have it. Although, yeah, um, <clears throat> there will be a D class person at the door uh, providing you with, well, let's say that something useful for your life. You're actually a D class person material yourself. But yeah, uh, but let's say we have a scenario where we have a monster, we've tried our best and we fucked up. And now we have a monster infestation. Uh, the one nightclub run by vampires is actually now a, actually uh, a city run by vampires into a country run by vampires. What will help us at that point? Well, uh, thank God engineers for all of these wacky things that we have. Uh, because actually, when thinking, uh, most monsters actually have a nervous system and they are not operated by magic. So, why not use nerve agents? Uh, nerve agents and chemical warfare are also uh, always uh, area control weapons and they're weapons of mass destruction, which are generally considered to be the last resort at any case, a point where other conventional methods are already lost. Uh, but they are an effective method of sterilizing cities and population centers of all sorts of organic threats without actually damaging the infrastructure. Say, if there was a monster infestation in, I don't know, the Hell City Convention Center, uh, and we really like, for some reason, we really like the uh, particular section of the Hell City, which we don't, but we really want to keep it for, I don't know, posterity and because it looks like it's a Soviet city. Uh, well, the problem with chemical warfare is that it's very imprecise. Uh, it relies a lot on uh, the weather, it relies on the chemical agents that are used, uh, age of the munitions, uh, because some of those deteriorate. Uh, weather is probably the worst. 
some of you will be remember with this, uh, will be familiar with the story from First World War that the actual first mustard gas attack used by the Germans actually blew the mustard gas on their own lines. So, yeah. But it works on basically any biological target. That's a plus. Uh, nerve agents are generally uh, medicated against with atropine or biperidin. These are supplied by, uh, well, in military, the military and most uh, civilian health control systems in case of a scenario. Uh, there are several methods of battlefield dissemination, including uncontrolled aerosol munitions, which are basically gas grenades uh, or smoke grenades. Uh, we have explosive dissemination, basically we have a uh, artillery shell loaded with uh, nerve agents uh, and an explosive charge which will uh, vaporize it and atomize it into the atmosphere of the target area. And then we have atomizers and humidifiers which can be weaponized, uh, which is useful. And we have boggers and such. There are many, many ways to use chemical weapons. But let's talk about organophosphates in specific. Uh, organophosphates are the most known the most used uh, variants of chemical weaponry, uh, and they function by blocking the functioning of uh, acetylcholine esters, which is uh, the delivery agent in human bodies which releases muscles from tension. Uh, by blocking that from working, it basically means that all muscles in your body tense up, and that restricts your blood flow, and you die of uh, asphyxiation, actually. Uh, the organophosphate nerve agents were invented by Germans in the 1936, uh, G series, uh, some of these are probably familiar to you, especially sarin. Uh, sarin was successfully used, well, successfully, debatably successfully used by the armed um, Shinrikyo death cult in Japan in 1995 gas attacks. Uh, luckily, they didn't kill many people with that. Uh, G family also includes examples like Tabun, Soman, and my favorite, cyclosarin. Uh, cyclosarin is a fun. Uh, version because it's also very flammable. So you can use it in a flamethrower. So you can also spray people with nerve agents and also set them on fire, which will also uh, uh, vaporize the already sprayed nerve agent, which will already be even further. Can you use it in a fire truck? Yes, you can use it in a fire truck. I like you! But what if it, what if it be destroyed if it uh, sets into fire? Uh, or does it say that it's, it's not destroyed that well at the top of it? Well, some of it is destroyed, but some of it will be also vaporized. Plus, you have a flamethrower full of it. Okay, okay. Flamethrowers have a fun function that they, they are actually just really big super soakers with uh, a controllable gas flame at the front. You can just turn the, the pilot light off, so you will be using it just to spray the stuff. And then when you feel like frying things, you can just light it on fire again. Uh, Psychosarin is. Excellent. Its uh, flash point is 94 degrees Celsius, so it actually lights up in really low temperatures. But uh, sarin is even more fun because it's actually easy to make. The materials uh, needed for it are, well, not widely available, but available. This is something that you should not try at home, or at work, or anywhere, really. <laughs> There's a chance that you only managed to make it once. Yeah. Quite big that, that yeah, and that's the point. Of, yeah, don't do this if you're not a chemist, and even then, just don't. These are nasty. Why am I teaching these things to you? All right, because we're role players. Uh, then there's the V series of nerve agents, uh, invented in the 1950s. Uh, VX is probably familiar for some of you. Uh, generally, uh, commonly used in movies such as uh, uh, The Rock, which is the the, the Nicolas Cage and Sean Connery movie about a terrorist attack on uh, uh, Alcatraz prison. Better movie than it has any right to be. Uh, funny thing about VX is that uh, 20, 124 short tons of VX was sunk into the Pacific Ocean by the U.S. Army during the fifties, a part of the uh, during the sixties, a part of the Operation Chase to destroy it. So somewhere in the Pacific, there are hundreds and hundreds of barrels of deadly nerve agents, which are slowly corroding in the bottom of the ocean. We were not very smart back then. From 1995 forth, uh, VX was destroyed by burning it, uh, and last batch of it was disposed in 2008. This is actually the last uh, VX landmine that was ever destroyed. So it's not in stock anymore, but 
I don't know, it's a good yeah, way to go. Yeah, they claim, but yeah. Uh, uh, chemical weapons are actually generally binary weapons, so they are not stored as a functional chemical weapon. They are stored as two different components which are mixed uh, only at the eve of its use. So they are a little bit more stable at that point. Uh, then we have Novichok, which is a Russian nerve agent, generally believed to be an organ of We don't know a lot about it, but it's claimed to be about eight times more potent than VX. But then again, we have Russians and we have propaganda. But you know this from TV, it has been used in the Britain to kill the... Uh, Wait, was it a, yeah, it was a, a former FSB or a KGB worker who uh, defected to the West and him and his daughter were exposed to it and they tried to kill them. Russia, of course, denies this, but it's pretty obvious. If somebody is using Russian nerve agents on foreign soil, it's probably the Russians. Also interesting because they either made it in-country or they smuggled it in, which is speaks a lot about the British Border Service. But we have even nastier things. Dimethylmercury, aka the nastiest shit ever. This is actually something that bothered me a lot when I started studying into this. Uh, dimethylmercury is a cumulative neurotoxin. It uh, is deadly in very, very small amounts. So of all those is about 0.1 milliliters. Uh, it absorbs through most event, uh, protective garments like latex, PVC, butyl, neoprene uh, in seconds, even multiple layers of them. Uh, uh, most well documented case of uh, mercury poisoning is the Karen Wethenhahn case in 19 somethings. Uh, when a small drop droplet fell on a protective glove in a lab environment, which absorbed the gloves and uh, uh, Karen Wetterhahn died 10 months later from mercury poisoning. Uh, this is a really, really sad case. Uh, there's a story that when they figured to pull the plug from her after 10 months, uh, Karen's husband asked that, uh, is she suffering? Because it looked like she was suffering and the doctor said that she ceased to be able to feel pain approximately three months in. Mercury poisoning is... Nasty, nasty. But isn't that uh, compared to the actual nerve agent that this is uh, something that requires a, a lot of more substances because it's about that a microgram uh, in like a cubic meter with an actual, actual nerve agent is, is a lethal dose, which is a very tough absorbed through skin, so that's actually required molecules more. Uh, no, this is more so than that amount. The 0.1 milliliters of uh, dimethylmercury was enough to give Karen Wethenhahn about 4,000 times uh, the deadly dose. So this is more so in very small amounts. But this is uh, this is something that if you use to hunt monsters, this is a uh, long time investment. It takes a couple of months to do something this way. But but by the point that they give out uh, symptoms of poisoning, they're already dead basically. So it's effective. Very nasty. Don't play with this stuff. But we have even more deadly things. <laughs> uh, in 1930s, the Germans were smart enough to come up with chlorine trifluoride, known as Enstoff, or Anstoff, translated from German. Uh, it's an interhaligan which is used in the refinement of nuclear fuels and uh, blastless edge operations and uh, semiconductor technology. Uh, it's a colorless, poisonous, and caustic as a gas, uh, condensates into a pale yellow fluid. Uh, it's very effective as a gas and an incendiary weapon. It's a very, very strong oxidizer. It's actually a better oxidizer than oxygen. Uh, it reacts with almost all organic and inorganic material, including glass and Teflon. Uh, it's hypergolic, which means that it burns even in an oxygenless environment uh, with non-flammable materials and uh, uh, other materials like glass and fabric, uh, wood engineers, uh, not to mention uh, asbestos sand and water with uh, which with it reacts explosively. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's it's a funny thing. Uh, there is an example disaster scenario where 900 kilograms of this stuff stuff spilled. It burned through 30 centimeters of concrete and 90 centimeters of gravel uh, and sand. Uh, the only ext extinguishing method for this is cooling, because, uh, as said, uh, 
it oxidizes itself. Uh, as we know, there are three things required for a fire. We need burning material, we need oxygen, and we need heat. Uh, and basically, it is its own burning material, so we can't take that away. Uh, it oxidizes itself, so stuff like halon or CO2 extinguishers are useless. Uh, uh, but we can lower the temperature by other means, but basically the best way to prepare for, an, for a chlorine trichloride fire is a good pair of running shoes. Uh, it ignites skin on touch, it absorbs through skin and it destroys bones and... Uh, 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 what is it? Wood. Uh, yes, bone marrow, uh, and it causes nerve damage. Uh, the cause of death from this stuff is uh, either burning or uh, fluorine poisoning. Yes? Uh, we actually used this stuff in a campaign once. Was... I like you. I like you. Uh, it gets better. It nice. gets better. We put uh, this in small copper balls into termite and then spread that. Correction, I like you a lot. And then ignited it. How yes. fucking crazy I mean that I'm the GM! <laughs> Just wait for a few slides forward. Why so, do you need a thermite if you have this? Why not? Not ask! So basically there was a story that they had uh, used in an RPG, copper balls which were filled with thermite and, and stuff. <coughs> That's nice! <laughs> it was uh, end stuff in copper balls mixed into thermite so that the thermite melts the copper ball that gives then stop from igniting it on itself. I like ah, it. And they, yeah, feel, yeah. That, and they feel that in a one uh, transport container and use that as drop ball. Yes. Actually, the container requirements are something we should talk about because this is a really caustic stuff. It basically melts through everything except uh, at 20 degrees Celsius, uh, steel, copper, and nickel form a protective fluoride layer, which prevents it from acting upon the base material itself. Uh, molybdenum, tungsten, and titanium form an unstable layer, so you should stick to those. Well, you should stick to steel, copper, and nickel. Uh, this was once proposed to be used as uh, rocket fuel, but then people realized that do we really want uh, a skyscraper at all, basically bomb filled with this stuff? What happens if we have a spill? It will basically destroy our entire launch complex. So, this is something that uh, actually there are anecdotes that Hitler looked at this stuff and decided that this was even the Germans thought that this was too dangerous, too dangerous to use. So, yeah. And those are do you guys. Remember who what they used in message with one six three. Sorry. Uh, do you remember what they used for message with one six three? Because I think they used two uh, binary rocket fuel, which two things were were mixed together, and well, it was also explosive. Yeah, I, I don't remember. The question was that what was the fuel that Germans used for their MB-163 rocket plane? I'm pretty sure that it was a liquid oxygen and something else. Uh, there comes a very icky picture. If you are squeamish about blood and molten flesh and bone, you should look away. This is what chlorine trichloride does to you when it hits your skin. That's nasty. I have even more disgusting pictures in this presentation. I am very sorry. Moving on. This is probably my favorite headline ever. Because uh, if we really fucked up, even the nerve agent didn't work, even the chemical warfare didn't work, what do we do? Thank God for engineers and their nuclear weapons. Uh, deviating from standard nuclear strategy, we would actually want to use fusion and hydrogen technology as our primary solution because those things vaporize their targets. Generally, in tactical applications, uh, smaller nuclear weapons are used because uh, in uh, conventional, uh, conventional nuclear warfare, which is a phrase I never thought I would say, uh, area denial is a primary because nobody likes to fight in or move through an irradiated area. But because in many mythologies, monsters regenerate, so they would probably survive from mild and heavy radiation poisoning. We would really just want to vaporize them from the get go. Yes? Would it have mutations caused by the radiation affect them more because they regenerate? Because regenerating tissue is more unstable. Uh, it's possible. Uh, Mutations caused by radiation are overblown in the media. They are not as uh, 
they are they don't happen as quickly or as effectively. Uh, mutations caused by radiation actually generally kill the mutated creature, so that actually might work in our favor. But when someone is regenerating constantly while suffering from radiation damage and mutations, we will probably just have a uh, eldritch clue monster against us instead of just a regular werewolf. Question, I think. And if they if they're heavily regenerating, that probably means they have better correct uh, DNA corrective mechanisms because they have to be able to make sure their own regeneration doesn't turn into cancer. So this is actually a very good point that uh, regenerating creatures actually probably have a better DNA correcting uh, system than humans have, so that they wouldn't develop cancer as they're regenerating. That's actually something something that a genetic person and or a real scientist should look into. I just play one. But back into nuclear weapons, uh, uh, use of, usage of nuclear weapons uh, has its risks. There is a very high chance of uh, uh, escalation into a global nuclear war, especially if we don't have cooperation with different countries with our monster hunting agency or bureau. So it's the absolute last resort for purifying a contaminated area. Uh, I am talking about this in a very clinical fashion because in this case, civilians or civilian casualties don't matter much, because at this point it's it's about survival. It should be about survival at every point, but uh, especially at this stage, if we have this large amount of a monster that they have uh, infested a city or even a larger area, we're basically on the brink of extinction already. Uh, next slide is also rather disgusting. It has a picture from a Japanese nuclear accident where a nuclear engineer was exposed to a high amount of radiation and they were kept uh, alive in a hospital for about three months after it. Uh, basically what happens when you get, uh, get a large dose of radiation, your uh, red blood cells begin, uh, no, your white blood cells begin to die and slowly your skin starts to come off and parts of your body begin to disintegrate. Uh, has anybody here seen the HBO miniseries Chernobyl? Chernobyl actually depicts radia acute radiation poisoning and its effects on the body quite accurately. So, if you're squeamish, look away. This picture is very disgusting. Uh, approximately three months into this, he was kept in a medical coma. At some point, he came to and uttered a single phrase in Japanese, but I don't speak Japanese, so he said, Kill me, I am not your guinea pig. He was kept in a medical coma against his will. For science. But let's see, what kind of nukes would we want to use? If we have a small scenario, say, uh, a common theme in, say, Vampire the Masquerade is that we have a vampire who are running a nightclub or something. Uh, a small target like that would be ideal for a W54 miniature nuclear warhead called Baby Crockett. These were developed by the United States in the 50s and 60s to be de uh, deployed into uh, West Berlin against the uh, Soviet board in an event of a land war in Europe. Uh, it's about approximately 23 kilograms uh, heavy, uh, about 10 to 20 kilotons, so not very huge. Uh, it's quite small as a munition in general. Launched from an M29 or uh, M20 or M21 re recorder gun, pictured here. Uh, it's fired either from a tripod or from mounted on a vehicle. Uh, you would basically want it mounted to a vehicle because I wouldn't want to be anywhere near a nuclear explosion you know, when it goes off, even if it's this small, the smallest of the one. Uh, Mortal radiation dose within about 150 meters of the ground zero. Uh, very fun fact about this thing is that uh, the United States actually developed a backpack which you could carry this in for a tactical insertion and deployment of it into a key strategic location. So, it would be a really nice uh, RPG spot that you would have a squad of monster, uh, uh, special squad monster hunters, which are deploying small nuclear bombs into monsters' hideouts and dens, and uh, remotely triggering them to uh, eradicate a large or an entire bunch of monsters at once. And, uh, well, there's a lot of numbers associated with nuclear weapons, which look really scary. Uh, there, there's, there are ways to be, visualize them too, uh, the effects of them, but 
let's use something close to home. Let's say if we um, snuck one of these into the, I don't know, lobby of the Helsinki Convention Center. Uh, here we have, this is nukemap.org, which is an excellent website. Uh, it's used for visualization of nuclear weapon uh, effects and damage. Uh, on the top we have mortality and, uh, what's the word there? Uh, expected deaths and expected wounded, I think. And then there are different things depicted in different colors. The smallest middle one is the size of the fireball. Red is the, God damn it, it's so small here. Air blast. Air blast. Uh, then we have uh, uh, air pressure and uh, something and something and something. Uh, basically anything within the yellow circle is completely eradicated. And at this range we're probably going to have uh, windows breaking and, uh, well, within the gray circle here, basically we just have a pit. So one of these would not quite be enough for the Helsinki Convention Center, but this would definitely wipe out, say, a vampire infested nightclub or a building, uh, like a, a skyscraper. This would basically just vaporize the bottom floors of the skyscraper and make the top floor down on it. Uh, but yeah, that's that, that's small. What, what do we have in the city? Well, thank God for the Russians. Uh, here we have the OCR-21 Tosha uh, mobile nuclear launch system. It's, uh, the missile itself is 6.4 meters long, about 0.65 meters diameter. Uh, mass of uh, 1800 to 2010 uh, kilograms, range of 70 to 185 kilometers. And a very nice thing about this is that uh, you can modify the warhead. The payload can buy the either chemical, uh, 100 kilos of nuclear warhead, EMP, or a frag. Uh, the two first mentioned would probably be the most useful for our needs. Uh, so you wouldn't need to be even close to that uh, area that you're using your chemical or nuclear weapons on. Isn't EMP also a nuclear blast, but it's just air uh, Every nuclear explosion does emit a certain amount of EMP, uh, electromagnetic pulse, but this is very widely overstated. Uh, Basically, you can protect against an EMP from a nuclear blast by putting your electrical device inside a filing cabinet. You don't need a hard shelter for that. Where does the EMP effect from that come from? Uh, I'm not completely sure because the Russians are very keen to keep that a secret. But that's claimed. Again, Russian things uh, especially, these are mostly just claims. We have no backing for these, but we're obliged to believe them because we're possibly going to fight against them at some point. Uh, so that's, that's small enough that you could actually use a civilian truck to keep it inside if you don't want to drive around the military with vehicles. Yes, uh, uh, this vehicle is actually quite small. It's about the size of a small truck or a very large van. Uh, you could hide this inside a civilian vehicle and drive it around and plant it somewhere and get the hell out of Dutch before exploding it. This is actually something that the Pakistan, Pakistani people are actually doing. Uh, entire nuclear arsenal of Pakistan is constantly driving around the country in unmarked vans because they don't trust their own people. This is very effective. So basically, if you're in Pakistan and stealing a van, you might actually be stealing a nuclear weapon. But this is an especially good nice thing. Yes. Trying to, trying to steal some uh, narcotics or something, something, something other criminal, they accidentally steal the wrong van and it happened to have a nuclear weapon. Yeah. yeah. Hate it slash love it when that happens. <laughs> but yes, this system is especially suitable for our needs because it's uh, uh, use, usable for swift and precise strikes because it's uh, an all-terrain vehicle basically. It can go anywhere and launch from most uh, different environments. And it has a medium to hot, well, medium range when speaking about missiles. So if we could basically be in, well, Hamelina and fire this on Helsinki, because of course I did a data map of this too. So now we're talking. Uh, the previous explosion's entire effect area is up, uh, contained within the fireball radius of this guy. So by this, we would basically just sever the downtown Helsinki from the rest of the country. Uh, if you were asking me, I would probably move a, a nuclear explosion a couple kilometers downwards, but uh, that's just me. Uh, but as we see, the, the death rate and the casualty rates are com uh, something completely uh, different than previous. Now we're, now we're starting to talk about something, but you know me, I'm, I'm fond of overdoing things, so here's the RT2PM2 Topol M. Uh, this was, this 
This is the baby scout launcher. This is the granddaddy's scout launcher. Uh, now we have a 22.7 meter long, 1.95 meter diameter, and 47 and a half tons of missile standing on this thing. Uh, that's an 18 wheel, ve wheel vehicle, which is also an all terrain vehicle. You can fire this from most different uh, environments and ram sites. Uh, we could now be on a different continent than our blast, which is very handy. Uh, our payload can be one 800 kiloton warhead or four to six 550 kiloton warheads mounted on a multiple independent reentry vehicle, which will, uh, if some people don't know what that is, it's basically a missile that separates into smaller missiles, which all can be independently targeted, which is handy. This was invented as a result of the Strategi Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty uh, in 1960s, which limited the amount of missiles that you have, but not the amount of warheads. So you could basically just slap more warheads on a single arm missile and be done with it. And this is actually even more effective than separate missiles. Theoretically immune to all countermeasures. Uh, of course, the Russians are not fond of telling us uh, how it actually works. So let's pray we never have to test that out. Uh, and the accuracy of approximately 350 meters sounds large. But when we're talking about destruction of this size, it doesn't really matter if we're here or 350 meters to other direction. It's going to be, the target area is going to be done. And uh, now we're starting to have nicer numbers up here. Like, if we have a vampire infested Helsinki or Helsinki infested by people who live in Helsinki, uh, this would be a very effective option. Uh, this would also wipe out my house, but whatever. But because, uh, during, in the modern world, the nu nuclear threat is uh, ever present, even in our uh, well, the everyday world, uh, especially with idiots like, no, well, certain idiots in control of countries which they shouldn't be, let's not name them, but you know, all know that I'm talking about Donald Trump. Uh, so let's talk about something different. So uh, let's talk about heavy flamethrower systems. A question first there. Uh, yeah, and one question about the whole, what if you do have a country infested. Yes, what if we have a country completely infested by monsters? The first question is, do we know that it's infested by monsters? Are the monsters smart enough to keep it to themselves and pretend to be human or not? Uh, let's say theoretically we would know that, for example, Sweden would be completely overrun by vampires. <laughs> <laughs> let's say a random country, by the way. Well, well, <laughs> yes, let's why, why, why would they not have spread out into neighboring countries by that point? No, but if we know that this is a very good point. If we know that most of Sweden, if if the like so-called vampire plague would have started in Sweden and it would have started rising, and we would know that <laughs> Norway and Finland are now very close to being taken over. Okay, so what if we have Sweden completely invested by vampires? Uh, then I am sensing some sort of neighbor hate here, but it's okay, let's go with it. Uh, Sweden is a particularly different, a difficult country because uh, there are very high population centers. And then there are areas where basically nobody lives. Basically the same with uh, the southern Finland and Finnish Lapland. Uh, northern Sweden is almost completely barren, sans a few large cities. Uh, that would be a huge uh, multiple year military operation where we would need to purify every single city. Uh, preferably first with chemical weapons, if that wouldn't work with nuclear weapons. And uh, then basically just sweep the entire country from bottom to, towards the north and flush everything still living out. And this would probably result in the country being reduced into a barren wasteland where nothing could live anymore. So this is the ultimate last resort of any scenario. Plus, if we were, would have to resort to the nuclear option, we would have to deal with the nuclear fallout and the, well, what follows with that. So there's also a threat of some level of a nuclear winter, which would uh, uh, cool down the entire planet. So, but, but at that point, that would be the smaller deal, because the vampires are a larger problem. And that would solve climate change. No, it would delay it. It would delay it. For 100 years, 200 years. Yeah, but it would also limit the population causing the nuclear, uh, no, uh, climate change. But let's talk about heavy flame flamethrower systems, because I like these, and I'm also very scared of these. Uh, TOS-1 Buratino is a 24 or a 30 barrel heavy flamethrower system. What that means is that it has uh, 24 to 30 rockets loaded with a thermobaric aerosol explosive warhead, uh, which is 
a warhead that's loaded with uh, a smaller uh, igniter explosive and uh, a couple tens of kilograms of uh, very fine aluminum <coughs> chaff, which is spread. First, it's a two-stage explosive. It, it's fired and it spreads uh, the payload into the target area and then ignites it. Uh, aluminum burns at a very bright flame, as we're here, uh, as we were here speaking about uh, uh, thermite, which is a mixture of uh, fine aluminum powder and uh, iron oxide. It burns in a very high, uh, very high temperature flame, and it uses up a lot of oxygen. So this method of operation is that it spreads aluminum dust into the target and then ignites it, which burns out uh, the uh, oxygen from the atmosphere on the target area, and also. Uh, warms the uh, uh, general uh, atmosphere of the target area into a couple hundred degrees, which would basically destroy any uh, biological threat that isn't uh, sealed in a hermetically sealed bunker. These have a range of 500 to 600 meters. Uh, 30 rocket barrage covers an uh, area of approximately 200 to 400 meters square. Uh, funny thing, this is uh, Approximately one third of the downtown area of Uopia. Don't ask me how I know. Uh, this is built on a T72 main battle tank chassis, which means that it is highly mobile in all sorts of terrains and it's very easy to. Uh, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Maintain. Maintain, yes. And keep running. And yeah, well, well if nukes are out of question, then implying burning down the house and everything around it is not a valid strategy. Because like we earlier, uh, earlier claimed, that, well, burning down the habitat of the monster is always an option, and burning everything within it. So yeah, um, that was it for my presentation today. Thanks. Sorry. And don't you worry, everything is going to be great. Uh, just let an engineer at it, and we're sold. Thank you. We still have about 13 minutes of time, so if you want to give questions or talk about different scenarios, I'm here for you. Yes? Um, how well would you think we work uh, stealing a building and then using something like the uh, blast plane for aluminum dust, that sort of thing? Uh, yes, uh, thermobaric equipment can actually be very useful in the confined spaces. Uh, in Especially in things like apartment complexes and uh, subway or metro systems. Because it's a closed environment, uh, and you could burn up the entire atmosphere out from there and burn everything with it. So you said it only heats up to about 200? Uh, a couple hundred, so it's 5 to 900 degrees <coughs> more like. Okay, a few hundred. Yes? Uh, while making the presentation, did you ever explore, uh, like, a, go across the idea and just think about what if the monsters would be as technologically advanced and as skilled as us with using them? Uh, yes, but that's a difficult scenario. Well, basically, the only two creatures that uh, will, are explored in media that could do that are vampires and werewolves to some extent. Uh, those are somewhat explored in the Underworld movie series, but I really don't recommend those movies for anyone. Uh, basically, we would be fucked because they, they, they have the upper hand on us uh, up to the point where. Well, at that point, it would be actually a valid strategy for humankind to go extinct, extinct and kill the monsters with us. So, yeah. That yeah. is the uh, heavy flame or um, uh, replacement pellets with uh, magnesium phosphate. They can have a giant dragon ball. Uh, dragon ball is strong. I think I love the bar. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, the question was, could you take the heavy claymore mine and replace the steel ball bearings with, uh, what was it? Uh, magnesium. Magnesium or thermite. Yeah. Oh yes, I like this idea. Or how about the copper ball <coughs> filled with... Uh, oh yes, so the uh, aforementioned copper balls filled with, filled with uh, hand stuff. Yes. Uh, I like this idea. I like this idea a lot. <laughs> Oh, and also you can strap those on drones and you can drive them around and be nowhere near it when it goes off. Yes? So I was going to say, I like, guess, you, oh, you, well, you, can modify, you can modify anything, I like, guess, the real question is that can you make it in a hard uh, manner with that, uh, with, with that much as the screwdriver and uh, home tools, because I mean, I guess you can of course replace anything from anybody, but can you take to do it easily or should you add 
a lot of they can claim more and put the other uh, pay load and use some duct tape around it because it won't of course be even nearly as efficient as possible. That's a thing that you can do in your well, base. Yeah. Yes, but I'm not going to teach you because I'm legally not allowed to. But this was a very good point. A common thing in yes, a common theme on monster hunting things in different media is that it is always a very ad hoc scenario, uh, supernatural case in points. Uh, but uh, nothing. Well, ad hoc scenarios are always fun. But if we really want to fight monsters, it's a military operation. Yes. Yes. I was thinking. There was mention of drones in the military part. How? What are we going to do when we start to use armored, armored drones and that kind of a part of all the weapon devices that will eliminate that partly uh, human form or at least enhance the combat abilities? Well, first of all, I personally hope that we never ever. Uh, make a completely independent drone system and give it a gun because we've got way too many movies about how that can go wrong. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, the Russians at least have done that at least once already. Uh, so, between the border of South and North Korea, there are fully automated defense units that target humans based on heat signatures. Hmm. Well, if they're just targets that they can't do that. <laughs> Well, it's Korea, it's basically just tower defense gaming. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, drones are an excellent thing because, oh, right, I forgot to talk about that. Uh, uh, the Chinese are actually manufacturing drones that are armed with flamethrowers. They are using them to uh, uh, not lose debris from electrical lines. Uh, they are just burning them off the electrical lines because it's way safer and cheaper to put a drone there and possibly electrocute itself than put a human in there. So what stops us from loading a drone's flamethrower with end stop or something even more nasty? We don't need to be in a hard way. Yes, you had a question. Uh, yeah, so we concluded that ultraviolet light is quite bad for vampires. Yes. Why don't we just make another sun, practically? Yeah, well, building a gigantic goddamn UV light and then shining it on, uh, I don't know, for example, Uppsala. Just a random CD. You seem to have growing animosity against the sweet. <laughs> uh, yes, we could really build a huge UV light and just burn things with that. That would actually be also a very viable option for area control against large spots of vampires uh, if we're waging a war against a vampire foe. Uh, but yeah, there are people who are do doing building second suns, and those are called fusion reactors, and those are very inefficient. And I am I am not a scientist enough to talk about fusion reactors aside from that they, they are cool and they draw a lot of power and generate little compared to it. Uh, I was thinking about the thermobaric explosion. Yes. Could you very miniaturize them to hand grenade size? Yes. Uh, these are called light phosphorus hand grenades, and they are very useful for all sorts of war crimes. <laughs> There was another question somewhere. Was there? Yes. Uh, I don't know if the detection was handled earlier, but uh, is there have you done it, or do you know if anybody's done any kind of calculations on at what point uh, are you automatically able to detect vampires by the percentage that they are draining the population? Uh, no, but that's actually a very good study that some better at mathematics should do. Uh, that's that's. That's that's good, but uh, yes, this is actually absolutely viable because uh, statisticians have uh, models for. There's actually a thing called the uh, Waffle Waitress Index, which uh, is used to uh, calculate the well-being of an economy in an area, and it is uh, based on the attractiveness of people serving waffles at uh, different diners and so on, because at difficult economic times, uh, prettier people who are not so useful at offices uh, are fired and they are forced to employ themselves elsewhere. So when we get prettier waitresses, the economy is going down. This is uh, awfully sexist, but unfortunately very true. So yes, any, all sorts of statistical <coughs> systems for detecting a vampire infestation is very viable. Yes? Uh, that's, that's just uh, my mind, me in the head, that's 
DNA scanning, if there is a, if the monster might have different kind of DNA, that would be an uh, excellent way to uh, scan the population, checkpoints and similar kind of things. Yes, but this would also require a huge uh, uh, DNA laboratory or a laboratory, biological laboratory to chart the monster's uh, DNA profile first. Uh, but yes, this is a very good plan too. Yeah, uh, for the last one, it of course would require the, the, the monster to have a different DNA. Thing. So if you think about that, then, for example, if the vampires are undead humans, then they would actually have more or less the, the DNA signature of a dead human. But I was going to think about a, a more of this, not really related to this, this vampire scenario, is that if vampires are going to keep a high vampire population, they should actually, actually start to add more iron to the food stuff so they could actually have a human. The human pro providing more red blood cells, so there would be better food for the vampires. Also very true. And something that just popped into my mind, when you are putting troops on the ground to fight a foe like vampires, you would definitely want to rig them with some sort of a dead man switch, that in a scenario where your troops are going to be casualties on the field, you don't want them to rise up as one of your enemies. So, you would want something that tracks a person's vitals, heartbeat, blood flow, so on and so forth, and when those are when a heart flatlines or blood flow stops, you want a small explosive that spreads some sort of a thing that is fatal to our vampire. So basically you just want a dead man switch every one of your troopers uh, for the case uh, where they might die in the field. And then you don't fit malfunctions. Yeah. <laughs> yes? Is there a reason vampires can't go vegan? Hmm. And like drink animal blood? Uh, some, actually, some mythologies cover this, like uh, about a thousand slides ago, when we were talking about uh, the different different models for the mathematical systems in here we go uh, in the Rice and Harris Meyer uh, no in the Harris Meyer Kostova model, vampires can drink animal blood and survive on that, uh, but the mathematical models still take into account that humans are generally uh, the most easy prey for vampire available. So, uh, the ease of feeding on humans is actually the point why the human population is going to be wiped out. Yeah, yeah, but in that case, wouldn't it just make sense for the whole human population to become vampires? And then start drinking animal blood? Yes, that is actually a very good point. Yeah, but I just, yeah. Uh, then if somebody doesn't want to be a vampire, you kill them. Technically, why would you though? Because you would limit yourself to living only at night. Yeah, and but if everybody's a vampire, you can also work around that. But that also means that you can be built to work around... Uh, yeah, but why would you when we're already an apex predator, which which doesn't really need systems like that? Because and also there is an even apex predator. Well, there is the or problem. Not. If they are dead, there is no population replen replenishing. And when one, one dies, there is no... For population is vampires, one dies. Yeah, that's a, also a very good point. Yes. Yeah, the environment would actually win. <laughs> but, but for example, when incredibly rich people want to become vampires, since vampires are commonly seen as you know age immortal. Right. Yes. So so if you have someone who would run a multi trillion dollar company, they would just want to become vampires and then try to as, you know, easily and shadily as possible, you know, divert their whole money and funnel it into supporting vampire rights. Yes. And build. Yes, I can totally see that happening. Because politics is all. Well, well yes, there is a, a, an adventure book for every one of you who are playing Vampire the Masquerade or any other game that has vampires in it. Make your goal be a very, very rich uh, corporate magnate who uh, has basically uh, inextinguishable funds to fight your uh, players. I would really like to, well, basically play Delta Green with me because nobody else wants to play Delta Green with me. I'm pretty sure that parts of this presentation are why, but yes, that is an excellent adventure. Okay, now we're running out of time, but that's good because we are done with the presentation. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>